So thank you everyone for joining us today for the Hoopo ECR webinar. We do these online panels every couple of months. Um, and today we have uh, Jessica and Sayantani to co-chair the session and they're going to go ahead and introduce the speakers. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. We do have the um, great pleasure of uh, introducing the speakers. And uh, to start, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Laurent Cateau. He's an associate professor of bioinformatics at the Université Catholique de Louvain. Laurent is actively involved in the development of bioinformatic tools for the analysis of complex proteomics data sets. Alongside this, Laurent is an advocate for open reproducible research and is a member of the Technical Advisory Board for the Bioconductor Project, a Software Sustainability Institute Fellow, and a Data and Software Carpentry Instructor. We're very happy to have you here. Um, please have the floor and share your slides. We're eager to listen to your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. I think you have already said it all. Um, let me see here again, green button, and then I want to screen two. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and so you see my slides. These are not really slides. They are more a uh, couple of notes that I'm displaying here. All the notes that I wrote down as a preparation for this uh, short presentation is available at this, um, this short URL. Um, sorry, here, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's my title, and that's the, the short URL where, where you'll find, uh, find my notes. So the, the first thing uh, that I'm going to do is to um, uh, describe a little bit my, my career so far. Um, and so I, I finished my PhD at the Free University of Brussels in 2006. Uh, that was on evolutionary biology. And um, I don't know, around 2003 or so, uh, my interests changed and also my, my needs during my PhD. And so I started a part-time degree in computer science at another university in Namib. In 2006, I finished uh, my PhD. And then given how things went on there in academia and also my personal circumstances, um, I moved job and I worked in industry for three years as a project manager and a bioinformatician. Um, and that was actually a really great experience because I kind of realized or I discovered different work environment. It was not too big, maybe about 15 employees or so. So it did work a little bit like a, an academic lab, uh, but with many more interactions between uh, people, uh, kind of a shared goal. And that that kind of goal-oriented work environment was, was really, really useful. And I worked there until 2010 because at some point I thought, well, oh, it's starting to run, run in circles. And then I had the opportunity to move back to to academia uh, in Cambridge at the university there. And that's also when I stopped this part-time degree in computer science. I had finished all my exams. I had started my maths project, but then I had to stop. So I never graduated um, to move to the UK. And so still on the kind of white blocks here, first as a postdoc or a research associate. And then after a couple of years, I got a promotion and got promoted to senior research associate. Uh, where I was able to earn some of my own funding and then start a small research group until 2018, where I moved, moved back to Belgium. And so nowadays I'm a professor at UC Louvain. I teach in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Biomedical Sciences, and I run a computational group at the, the Duke Institute. So that's more for the kind of the formal aspects of my career. But uh, in pink here, I wanted to highlight some other activities that were really influential in, in, in the things I've been doing for many years now and that I still do and I plan to do until the very end. And the first one is open and reproducible research. And I knew what open research was and, and kind of open software development before, but it's only in 2010 that I started to really appreciate how important this was for me and for multiple reasons. First one is that for me, it's part of rigorous research, you know, working openly, working uh, reproducibly, uh, and making sure that others can benefit from what I do. Um, but I think a, another really important aspect here was that um, 
you know, I think, especially as early career researchers, sometimes this environment um, can be a little bit restrictive and even oppressive. And I think this openness in, in our research is, is a really important aspect and we're working together in the community. Uh, and that has really become kind of a driving force, not only for myself, the way I work and I run my lab now, but also I've been trying to be quite vocal about it uh, during the years. And the second aspect is the Bioconductor Project. It has been really instrumental. It has allowed me to, you know, over the years to meet and be influenced by, you know, really outstanding scientists. And it has offered me an international environment to, to grow and really flourish. And so my first Bioconductor package was, I think, submitted and accepted around 2017. The package has been kind of, uh, removed since then. Um, uh, I have developed and, and published many more since then. Um, I have been a you know, package reviewer. Um, I've organized many European Biocon Bioconductor conferences in Cambridge in 2019 in Brussels, last year in Ghent. I've been a member of the technical advisory board since 2018. Until very recently, I was part of the Code of Conduct Committee, part of the Social Media Committee. I started and, and co-lead the teaching committee where we are quite active. Uh, it's very, very interesting interactions. And in 2021, I start with, with many other people, of course, and then co-chair or deputy chair of the European Biochemical Society. So again, being part of this international community has been very important and, and very influential. And so the question at, at hand here today is, how have you been recognized for your work? And so first I want to kind of maybe, again, put into context some of the work I've done. And of course, this is very, very subjective because um, I'll probably more, I'll be telling about what I hope I have been recognized for. And I'm not sure if that's really what I'm being recognized for. And what I also want to kind of get over with is, of course, to highlight that papers are important. Um, and without papers, you won't get any academic recognition. But um, of course, that is part of a problem, I think, because when you do research, there is much more than papers. And I'm, I hope lots of you have already heard about this quote from Buckheit and Noho you know, in, in 95, that an article about computational science is a scientific public uh, in a scientific publication is not the scholarship in itself. It's merely advertisement of that scholarship. The actual scholarship is the whole computational infrastructure and the set of instructions that generate figures and, and the results that are advertised in that paper. So yes, papers are important, but that's not all there is. So the word that I think um, I get recognized for um, is the development and applications in, in spatial and single cell proteomics. Uh, lots of open research, open and reproducible research, as well as open and collaborative software development. Uh, many contributions to R and Bioconductor, and not just developing new packages, but also maintaining these, as well as um, teaching in, in international workshops. And I think the my publication strategy is maybe one way to illustrate um, what I think is, is important in this work and the, kind of the open aspects. So typically we start by releasing our software very early, open source, we submit them to Bioconductor and they get reviewed. And then afterwards we write a preprint about the software or the application of that software, including code that makes the whole analysis reproducible. And then eventually, of course, we submit the preprint to a paper and then it gets, gets peer reviewed. And so I think I have gained some reputation as someone that has expertise in computational quantitative proteomics, including, and I think that's important, kind of technical aspects, uh, in addition to the more kind of scientific or standard academic outputs. And so in terms of recognitions, I suppose, you know, invitation to give talks, that's for the scientific outputs. Invitation to teach at workshops, that's more for the technical skills and then also my interest in terms of teaching and pedagogy. And then invitation to submit papers are obvious goals or signs of recognitions. But um, a couple of years ago, I was recognized for my open collaborative contributions to Bioconductor and with 
through a Bioconductor Community Award, and that's certainly one of my proudest moments um, in, in line with, with this desire to be open and reproducible in what, I, in what I do. And very high on that list is also the many contributions that one of the packages that have been around there for many years, MSMBase, um, that, that received, and MSMBase has benefited tremendously from many, many contributions. And some of these have led to um, you know, other initiatives, uh, such as the ARPA Mass Spectrometry, with people that has been stopped, with people that I have never directly worked with. We never worked in the same lab, but we kind of grew this, this network through these remote collaborations. But what matters most in my eyes, you know, there are these kind of official recognitions, but what matters most in, in my eyes in the end is this, um, and, and what is the most meaningful recognition would be this, this shared values that we promote through our research and this intrinsic motiva motivation that drives us. Like we, we need this intrinsic recognition and this intrinsic values and motivations to, to get us to carry on doing, doing that research. Um, so all this has been written down in much more, many more details. Um, so feel free to read up about this. And I'm not sure whether I should already mention the, discuss the different questions um, that we were supposed to uh, yes. So we yes. will go through all the presentations first and then we will uh, address all the questions. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. And we'll address the questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, then I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lauren. That was very interesting and a very interesting presentation style as well. Uh, just a reminder to everyone in the audience, feel free to... Uh, put your questions down in the chat, but you can also directly ask once we have all the speaker presentations done. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Stacey Malakar from Yale University. Uh, she's an assistant professor of chemistry at Yale University, uh, and she develops methods for the mass spec analysis of glycoproteins, particularly mucin, um, mucin or glycoproteins, and has been recognized for her work in the form of several awards. These include, but are definitely not limited to the Chemistry Biology Interface Division Horizon Prize from the Royal Society for Chemistry, the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Early Career Faculty Award, the Rising Stars in Proteomics and Metabolomics for 40 Under 40, and many more. These are just a few listed out. Uh, and with this, we are, we are definitely very excited to have you here and hear uh, your side of how to get recognized uh, for the work. And please feel free to share your slides. Uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, let me get this. Uh, does that look good? Yes, you cool. see the slides. All right, well, thank you, Sayantani, for uh, the introduction. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just kind of give a little bit of background in terms of where I come from in my history. Um, I grew up in Detroit and I went to the University of Michigan for undergrad. I then did my PhD at the University of Virginia under the guidance of Don Hunt. I then did my postdoc at Stanford with Carolyn Bertozzi, and then that led me to Yale, and I started about three years ago as an assistant professor. Um, at the University of Michigan, I worked two jobs. One was at a bulk grocery food store, but the other was actually in a, a peptide synthesis core, and so I performed peptide peptide synthesis, and then used um, mass spec basically for quality control. And that was really my introduction to mass spec and that got me excited about that. Um, and that actually led to an invitation to join Don's lab at UVA. And that's really where I got the fundamentals of mass spec uh, kind of hammered into me throughout my graduate career. Um, and Don and I really accrued a, a an excellent relationship. Uh, he's he's kind of a goofball. This is him trying to open a, a champagne bottle at, at some point. He was eventually successful. Um, but I also, during graduate school, got introduced to glycobiology, and I sort of just got a taste of it by identifying glycopeptides that were presented by the MHC class one and two processing pathways. And as I got further and further entrenched into the world of glycobiology, um, Don at one point pulled me aside and was like, you know, I never really wanted to work with carbohydrates. And so I, I think it's time for you to to go do a postdoc. Um, and so I cold emailed uh, Carolyn, uh, who had just moved to Stanford, 
Um, and here's a picture of her being a badass, which I think everybody knows she is. And here's a picture of her receiving the Nobel Prize uh, a little while ago. Now, uh, I think there was a little bit of luck and a little bit of timing involved in this because she had just moved to Stanford and really wanted to invest in mass spec. And so basically I got there and she handed me a million bucks and was like, buy a mass spec, set it up, get it running. And so that was really um, fortuitous for my, for my career because then I was basically running this instrument for a lab of 40 people. So I was involved in pretty much all of the mass spec work within that group, as well as um, developing my own kind of independent projects. And that's really where I got introduced to, as Sayantani said, a class of proteins called mucins, which are heavily O-glycosylated. So during this time, I characterized an enzyme called a mucinase, which selectively cleaves mucin proteins into peptides that are more amenable to mass spec analysis, because we can't generally use trypsin to analyze these proteins. So that kind of spun out into my independent career. So now this is my group at Yale. And uh, yeah, as I said, we kind of focus on developing mass spec techniques that enable uh, the, the analysis of these, these proteins. And so we work on ionization techniques, enrichment techniques. We also uh, uh, try to develop software and or evaluate software um, along with Nick Riley. We are heading up the second human glycoproteomic initiative study where we're basically sending uh, the same data file to 20 different developers and then seeing which, which software programs work best for different um, sample types. And the ultimate goal is to really be able to sequence these very, very large complex proteins at the glycoproteomic level. And not only that, but really understand, um, you know, how glycosylation and these mucin domains are contributing to protein function, cellular health, disease, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that my kind of suggestions regarding getting recognized for your work kind of follow uh, one main theme, and that is visibility. Um, you need people to know who you are in order to get recognized for your work. And this can take a multitude of different forms. Um, the first thing that I recommend is actually be familiar with the available awards that you qualify for. Um, and so if you don't know these different awards or, or what's available then and you're not applying for them, it's unlikely that you will go on to receive them. And so I wasn't familiar with this kind of setup when I started as a faculty member, but in academia, it's very common that you need someone to nominate you. And it's often common for a senior mentor in the department to ask people to nominate you. So for my mentor in the department, I have assembled this very extensive list of possible awards that I'm eligible for, as well as a list of people that would be good to nominate me for different fields. I have a list for mass spec, I have a list for glycoproteomics, biology, glycobiology, so on and so forth. And so that then allows us to kind of have a timeline for when we need to be asking people for letters and a good list of people that we could ask for letters and so on and so forth. So the nomination process, I think, was a little bit unfamiliar to me when I started. But um, again, even if you're at a graduate level or a postdoc level, being familiar with what is available to you is really kind of step one in getting awards. Um, additionally, I think social media is a huge way of, of kind of selling your work and making your work well known. And so I really hated Twitter or X or whatever um, a while ago. And when I joined Carolyn's lab, you know, she's got 60,000 followers or something. And I really witnessed how much like her tweeting a paper or something that's going on in the group or an award for a member increased visibility of that person's work or that person's you know success. And so I really love Twitter for sharing work. But since there's been kind of a mass exodus, I also now have been using LinkedIn pretty frequently to share work when people are not um, on Twitter. Uh, and also ResearchGate, I, I, I tend to use that a little less uh, commonly, but that's another method for increasing your visibility. 
Um, I also have found that networking via interest groups or mentoring pods is a really, really great way of just meeting people and networking. And so I'm very active in FEMS or Females in Mass Spectrometry. And in FEMS, we have these mentoring pods where it's usually a group of, you know, eight to 12 people. And you really get to know those people very well over the course of, you know, the academic year that you're involved and so, you know, if there's a graduate student in that group that I think is good for an award or, or something like that, you know, I can recommend that to them. And it's really just kind of increasing the personal relationships that you have. And there are also many different types of, of these groups. Um, and uh, TAMS is the Triangle Area Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group. There are similar groups in Boston and the Bay Area, um, the Washington, D.C. area. And so that's another opportunity to kind of use your local network to build up your network and kind of increase your own visibility. Um, I did not really attend very many conferences when I was in grad school, partially funding, partially no one else in the group was going. And as when I was in my postdoc, I really, really uh, understood the value of attending conferences to increase your network, to sell your work, to present your work. And um, I also found that chairing sessions is another great way of meeting people um, through just kind of evaluating the work, meeting people in the sessions, and so on and so forth. Um, I think something that is very useful is making sure that you're visible online, that you have some sort of online footprint, whether that be an individual website. I've seen a lot of postdocs, especially those that are going on the market, have their own website now. Um, and having a Google Scholar page to me is very valuable. Um, and so I think that was the, the primary um, suggestions or recommendations that I have. I think the last thing, and this is a little bit more hard or harder to attain, is really kind of finding a niche in the scientific world that makes you the expert in that space. Because the more unique you are, the more likely people are to think of you when they think of, you know, a, a particular field or, or area of study. So hopefully that's helpful and I'm happy to answer questions uh, as we move forward. Thank you very much for a lovely presentation. Uh, once again, I'd like to remind all the participants that if you have any questions, I'd like to encourage you to just jot them down in the um, uh, Q&A box. We'll definitely have some time for that uh, at the end. Uh, moving on, I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Juan Antonio Vizcaino. He's a team leader in proteomics at the European Bioinformatics Institute, part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory family. Juan has been hugely important in the Proteome Exchange Consortium and the development of PRIDE, the Proteomics Identification Database. Juan continues to be an active member of the proteomics community with a focus on addressing some of the bioinformatic challenges associated with large proteomic datasets. We are very happy to have you here and we are eager to um, listen to your advice. Thank you very much, Jessica, for your very nice introduction. I will share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the good thing about being the last one is that many of the things that uh, are important to mention have been already mentioned by uh, Laurent and Stacy. But um, maybe it's good to, to listen to them again. First of all, I just wanted to also give an overview of my career, just for everyone to, to be on the same page. So originally I was working as a web lab uh, researcher, sorry, for years. I had a degree in pharmacy and biochemistry in the University of Salamanca in Spain, I originally from Spain. And then I did a master's in food microbiology and then a PhD in molecular biology. And all this was done in a beautiful city in Spain, it's called Salamanca. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Place and it's a very nice city for students especially. So if you haven't visited, I, I can only recommend you to visit. And, and then as a postdoc, um, and this was due to, you know, different reasons and many of them were just by chance. And you realize also in, in your career, many, many things uh, happen by chance, just for being in the right place in the right moment. That's something that you also need to take into account. 
I moved into bioinformatics. So as a web lab researcher for many years, I moved into bioinformatics. It was a hard transition, but it was of course very worthwhile. First, I was working in a genomics project in the University of Sevilla in Spain as a postdoc. And then since 2006, uh, September 2006, I've been working mainly in mass spectroteomics uh, and here at the ABI, European Bioinformatics Institute, in which is located very close to Cambridge here in the UK. First, I was the, a postdoc, then a bioinformatician, uh, then a group coordinator. And since 2016, I, I became a proteomics team leader. So I don't need to say also that Cambridge is a very nice place to visit if you haven't visited. Uh, so it's a very nice city for students. I think also Logan can agree on that. And uh, again, I can only recommend you to visit if you haven't been here. And I also wanted to highlight that apart from, you know, as part of my job, but also part of also, you know, what I will, but what I like to do, I've, I have led or have participated in, in several community projects advocating for open data practices and, and data reuse. And this is in the same, you know, in the same kind of idea that uh, Logan has been participating in the, um, Bioconductor and uh, I don't know this. I think this is increasingly important. I've been involved in protein exchange, the consortium of proteomics repositories, also the proteomics standards initiative, which uh, takes care of developing open data standards in proteomics. Something called here in Europe Elixir proteomics community, which is important for developing of uh, software and tools in proteomics, um, and many other things on the side. But I think I will mention this again. It's in, increasingly important to to participate in these kind of projects. So how I was originally recognized for my work. So you have to take into account that I finished my PhD quite a long time ago. So in 2005, and at that time, I mean, also when I was kind of a PhD student at the time, and also in Spain, you have to take that into account. There was almost exclusive focus in academia. There was no one talk at that point, or, you know, as opposed to moving to industry. And that was very bad at the time. It's good that things have changed now. So at the time, I, I for me, it was really key to have first author publications because this was key for me to get a postdoc fellowship. And that means that, of course, I could kind of switch to bioinformatics because I, I had my kind of my own money. And then, you know, it was easier for me to get accepted somewhere because, of course, if you don't have any experience in a topic that you would like really to move to, then it's going to be difficult to, to find people that, uh, you know, that give you a job. So it's much easier to, to have your own fellowship. I also think that it's important to have extra publications with other, with other team members, even if you are an author in the middle or something like that, because that always shows that you can collaborate and you can work with others. And also as a kind of ECR for me was extremely important because it really opened my mind and it, it brought, it, it took me to, you know, different ways of working. So my PhD supervisor at the time was really supportive of getting you know, internships, uh, sort of stays in international um, uh, international settlements. And I had the opportunity to go to Hungary, to UK as well here, to USA. I was in Texas A&M. And also uh, American football was uh, very important there that I, I learned that. And also in France. And then, of course, I also was mentioned by the other speakers, presentations in conferences opportunities for networking and I also got a couple, a couple of awards at the time what I, I think also is important uh, what Stacy said about you know having a, a list of the awards you can you can apply for and um I just want to highlight some ideas that have been mentioned before by Lauren Stacy being recognized for your work today for academia again publications are really important at all levels they are not the only thing of course but as an ECR is important to have uh, first author publications because again, getting a postdoc fellowship uh, can make you more independent at that point. Maybe you have more freedom to choose where you want to work. But also publications are, for the better or for the worse, important in any stage on, on your career. I think that for industry, the whole skill set and overall experience counts more or is maybe appreciated more. Publications are still part of the mix because they mean that you can finish projects. I think that's a, a way to show that. But uh, I mean, there are many things that are very important in industry, but also in academia. But I would like to highlight this, especially for if you want to do other jobs uh, outside academia. Some of them are GitHub profiles, if you are a bioinformatician, contribution to open software, maybe your own software tool. This is really very important. 
Again, this is part of the visibility concept that also Stacy mentioned before. Communicate the science you do. YouTube videos about your research are great. I find that uh, I um, sometimes have been kind of uh, a judge for this kind of uh, YouTube videos, and I find them great. And uh, there are people that are really good doing them. But also scientific blogs, social media, Twitter X, or, or your own personal website. Uh, and I would like to highlight just to finish that you can really never do enough networking when you are in CR. No people develop your own brand. And uh, I think that it's also important how to learn how scientific organizations work. I think that committee work, is, is, you like to do that, it can really be important in the context of scientific societies because scientific societies are very keen to have ECRs on board. And you can really meet kind of important people in your field there, you know? And um, and they will be happy to help you in the future if you need their help. So if you are uh, if you have that kind of inclination to be part of scientific societies, I don't know here in the I mean the National Societies for Proteomics here in Europe or the European one or UPO of course, uh, you can really meet uh, important people in your field. I, again, they will be happy to help you in the future. That's for sure. So I think that's also important to mention. And also from my perspective, I think it's also important to get involved in community projects. You have the opportunity to get involved there. Like again, what mentioned, Logan has mentioned before, Bioconductor, or I don't know, we have been mentioning, uh, have been involved in PSI for many years. You will learn a lot. You will, uh, you will meet a lot of people. And maybe again, this will open your mind for kind of ideas that uh, things that you could do in the future. And, and that's it. I think that was basically everything I wanted to highlight. Uh, thank you, Juan, for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely sharing these ideas. Yeah, you're, you're right. There's never enough networking mm -hmm. for ECRs. Um, and with that, I will open the floor for questions. Um, please feel free to put your questions down in the Q&A, or um, I guess you can also raise your hands and ask directly. But uh, while we're waiting for questions from the audience, I think I can get on with the first question. Um, so maybe you can answer in the order of the speakers uh, as you presented um, or whoever wants to jump in. It is uh, not, no real rule. Uh, so the first question that we had from our list was, uh, when hiring a new postdoc researcher for your group, what are the most important attributes for them to have on their CV? What do you look for um, the profile other than their publication history? Um, uh, <clears throat> So I have listed four points. The first one is, is the, uh, does the candidate's skills really match the project's need? It sounds obvious, but sometimes, or often you get CVs and you wonder why have they applied to this project? So that's the first one. And that also shows that it's important to write a CV and a letter that is adapted to the job that you're applying for. So I look for very concrete signs of mastery. And um, I'm going to explain what this means. So I, I have regular appraisals with the people in my group. Uh, they are kind of very constructive discussions about kind of long-term plans and what people want. And one of the qu questions in this appraisal is, what do you want to become an expert in, right? And in a CV, I want to find what is the candidate really good at, right? What are they going to teach me? What are they going to bring to the lab? I think it's important when you present yourself in the CV to say, you know, I'm the expert in this. And I want to see that. If it's all wishy-washy, I have done this and that, but I can't figure out what they are really good at, that's not a good, good, good sign for me. And again, as I mentioned about, you know, open and collaborative, I will be looking for open or public code, right? Such as a active, and that's an important GitHub or GitLab profile and repositories. If I see GitHub profile, but there were two commits, you know, years ago, and since then it hasn't been used, this is not going to tell me what I'm looking for. And then also contributions, and especially contributions to other people's projects, uh, I think is a really good sign to see that that person really wants to, you know, is, is interested and has the technical skills. And then last but not least, I will be trying to assess whether the candidate is going to be a good team member, you know, it will, will fit in in the lab. And that's obviously very difficult to, and, and a, a part subjective to assess, but um, we, as in the lab, the interviews are always done with everybody in the lab, will be looking for kind of, you know, red flags pointing to, to the control. 
and you know if the interview was done remotely and there are any doubts i would definitely invite the person on site and and make sure that they meet the group but also the, everybody in the group meets the person and i would certainly not take any risks to somehow you know harm or harm the cohesion of the group so these are my four main points yeah i'll kind of echo some of those points i think the main thing that is is somewhat cv related but is just fit like what are the skills that this person has is it going to complement the group and also yeah personality and fit it is does it jive with the current group members and kind of interactions that we currently have um additionally and i mean you know i'm relatively new at this so i've only had so much experience but uh, a detailed cover letter is probably like the most important thing. That's the first thing you're going to see. And it can tell you immediately whether this person is just spamming everyone at the institution or if they've really thought about and considered, um, you know, what you're doing and how they can add to it or, you know, complement the skill set of the group. Um, and so if there's a really detailed cover letter, that to me is probably the most important thing. Um, because even at the time you're applying, your your papers might not have come out, you know. And so, like, if your if your publication record isn't great, but there's a lot of good things on the horizon that you're working on and finishing up, then that's a, that's a good sign. Um, and then, of course, like personal recommendations, especially from people, other PIs that I know, end up being really important to me as well. Again, being new at this, I sort of lean on those people that I trust. Um, so. I think it's less about having certain attributes on their CV and more about kind of all of these other extraneous factors. Yeah, I, I kind of echo the same things that have been said before. So I think that on one hand is what the person can do and, you know, what he has or he or she have experience in. And, and apart from the publications, for us, since we do computational work, it's important to look at what that person has done in the past. And of course, for that, GitHub profiles, as Noam mentioned, are really important. And again, not only your own software, but maybe contributions to the software made by others, so to kind of, again, community projects. And, and apart from that, really the most important thing, in, in my opinion, if they are not really kind of red flags is how you think the person is going to fit into the team because of course if you are bringing a new person you want that you know this is kind of uh, has a synergistic effect so, so you know that the, the, that, the, that the team continues to work well the last thing you want is to have problems uh, with anybody or, or I don't know uh, that's kind of my experience over the years because um, we are already we have already enough kind of problems with, uh, you know, it's already challenging and we are all very busy. So the main important thing is that you consider that this person will be a good fit. Um, and of course, again, like as Logan said, this is subjective, but, um, but you know, one gets better, I think, in time <laughs> with this kind of uh, things. And, and of course, I mean, you can never be 100% sure. And if the interview is remote, it's also a good idea to invite the person on site. That's for sure. If you are not 100% sure. Of course, if you have, uh, you know, people that have worked with this person in the past, it's also good to, good to us. Sometimes it's not the case. So at the end, you have to basically uh, trust your instincts. But uh, I would say that these are the most, the most important points. Thank you very much. I see we have um, a question from uh, some of our some of the participants. If you want to write it uh, in the in the chat, um, that'd be great. Um, for now, we'd we'd like to move on to uh, the next question, uh, directed to all the panelists. Of course, how would you recommend that ECRs promote their work other than research? Uh, for example, teaching, outreach, committee work. Is there anything they can do uh, other than that to add um, to their to enrich their CV? So well, maybe I go first to start. 
So, I mean, I think I included some of some of these ideas in, in my presentation of course to other speakers as well. I think that as an ECR, you, you need to kind of develop your own brand as, as much as possible. And it depends on what you like to do apart from you know, the purely academic work. Some people like a lot, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing YouTube videos, or uh, and actually they do it very well. I I I I, I recommend all the world that is related to social media and kind of promoting science and community science is increasingly important. If your interests are also in um, committee work, again there are many uh, scientific organizations. UPO being one of them, but many others that are interested in having uh, ECRs on board, and that can be very synergistic for you as an ECR because you will learn how these scientific organizations will work and and you will learn a lot I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure for for uh, for your future uh, career it, maybe you don't learn anything that is applicable to for your experiment the next day in the lab but uh, maybe you do or if not you will learn definitely a lot of skills that are important in your kind of uh, you know in in your life but also they can also help you uh, in the future because again, a lot of people are involved, important people in, in the sense that they are well known in the field are in, involved in these scientific organizations. And if you know it, you have done a good job in, in, in these committees, they, they will definitely help you in the future. I don't know, writing reference letters or talking to someone that maybe uh, again, like Stacy uh, mentioned before, that maybe they know you and they, they can help you to get that job in the future. And the last thing that I think it is also important is to get involved in kind of a community project, Bioconductor being one of them. I mean, you or Galaxy or I don't know, <laughs> or PSI or or Eubic or many of them. I think that that will help your networking a lot. And that also will help you to understand how how uh, scientific um, work can, can also work in this context. Um, yeah, hang on, what was the question? I think I kind of mentioned most of my ideas in my presentation, um, getting involved in kind of community groups, you know, FEMS, your discussion group areas, um, and yeah, serving on committees for different different organizations. I think all of that, uh, I think has, has pretty much been covered in terms of what my ideas would be. Uh, uh, Maybe very briefly. So yes. Oh, and papers. You mentioned mentioned papers in the question, but preprints too. Publish preprints early on. They are really important. So adding lines to your CV, I think, is important, right? Because if there is something on the other purpose purpose CV and it's missing in yours, this could be called against you. But be pragmatic, right? Not at all cost. It's enough to organize one event or co-organize one event. Don't do it every year. It's enough to teach once. You don't need to overload yourself with teaching because don't forget that your postdoc years are the, should be the most productive from a research point of view. So do research and advertise your research as much as possible, right? So make sure people realize that it's your research and not just your supervisors, right? Your advisor. That, and you are not just a vehicle for somebody else's research. Show that it's yours and show that you're ready to go the extra mile to really deliver the best you can. For example, open reproducible research. Again, I'm running in circles here, but that's what's really important for me. And then I think a third point is do what you like. You know, do things you like. And sometimes you'll have to do things you don't really like, but nothing beats motivation when it comes to convincing others that you are the right fit. Uh, and if you spend time doing things you don't like too much, that, I mean, it will come across that you are a bit bored. And so, you know, that that would be shooting yourself, not in the foot, but in the face. So, you know, do things you like, and then, you know, this, this motivation will transpire. Thank you very much. Uh, we The next question we had was also related to the social media and uh, I think we, we covered it. So we have a few more questions that came from our ECRs previously. One of them is what metrics are looked at to be recognized as a main contributor in the field?
kind of threw everyone off a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a main contributor to the field, probably your publications, right? Like, and, and, and your, again, visibility slash work in the field for community efforts. So I think it's a more, uh, the question comes more from the point of view that if you are working on something specific, are you trying to gain visibility in that area of research or are you trying to build a, you know, a broader sense of what your research is? Um, would, would you be, yeah, publication would be one, but how would you kind of progress towards it, I guess? Maybe I can give a small comment. Of course, ideally, you want to be an expert in one very specific niche where people think of that and they then associate your name. And then you also want to show that you are not just a, what's this sentence, you know, one trick or, you know, you, you know more things, you have a wider expertise. Of course, the more the better, always. But I think if you can demonstrate that you have gained expertise in one specific thing, but by expertise, I mean, really mean you are better than more, not the average, right? You are among the top experts and it could be some programming, it could be an experimental technique, it might be knowing all the ins and outs of you know, your favorite system. Um, that is something that even if you have applied it very specifically, that you will be able to transfer to other projects. And I think that is something that will stand out, whether you work in something very niche or maybe something of broader interest. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, here's another question that might be a little bit uh, more uh, specific, but uh, getting recognized for software uh, contributions is uh, particularly challenging. Many people do not cite the software that they use. So what uh, tricks uh, do you, can, can you use uh, to show peers and funding agencies that, uh, that your work is impactful? Should I reply to Jan, uh, that, Laurent, or you, you want to reply? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. Okay, so this is one of the most uh, challenging topics <laughs> for the people that work in, in, in bioinformatics and in, and in infrastructure. So, so it's always difficult to demonstrate the, the impact of the work of, of what you do. So, I mean, the first thing that you need to do is in all the software that you do is basically ask people to cite you. Even if they don't cite you, just you just need to put like, you know, uh, signs, uh, I don't know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, text in the in the website that you have resource that, you know, they should, they should cite you. So don't be shy in asking to be cited. That's kind of the first thing that I think uh, I think you should do. Then if you have a software, something that also you, you can do is to put it available again for someone, uh, for the community to download and, you know, number of downloads and, and similar kind of metrics like uh, you know access to websites or you know kind of this kind of as uh, um this kind of similar um metrics are also important i think also in a way i mean this is kind of uh, unrelated but um data sets are also important increasingly important here and you put together the data set with the with the software that can also kind of increase the impact of of the of the of the whole thing together, and and then is again what uh, has been mentioned before. So contributions to open software. I mean the the commits integration. Kind of how many people you need to come up with other estimations. Of how many people are using are using the software? And kind of one proxy for that can also be you know the number of years that that project has been alive or that uh, actively. Act actively alive, I mean, or, you know, the number of people that are contributing to, to the code, this kind of um, in, indirect metrics that are also kind of, um, are, are also important for this. Uh, and maybe I forgot other things, Logan, maybe you have other, <laughs> other things that maybe I forgot. <clears throat> One simple solution would be to quickly write a small paper, write a F1000 research, I can even, it's more of a manual. I think that that count as a paper of well, informatics has these application notes. These tend to be a little bit annoying or or just a preprint. You could even write a preprint about your software. So you have 
a paper-like thing to cite, but even software, um, you know, you can generate. So if you archive your GitHub repository, for example, if there is software, you get a, a DOI, right? So the, the archived version, the Zenodo archived version has a DOI, and this is something that can be cited. Um, Bioconductor packages also have DOIs, so they can also be cited. Um, so if you already provide all this, and in your software you say, if you use it, please cite here and there, and it's already made um, citations that people can reuse, that will already facilitate it. Because if you expect people to say, oh, I use that software, that version, and then, which they're supposed to do, but if they don't get the, you know, an easy way to cite a software, um, then of course it's, it's, it's difficult. So there are these tricks where you can essentially get a DOI for your software and not for the paper that could help. Right, thank you so much. Uh, Stacy. did you want to add something to it? No, I was just gonna say, this is not my <laughs> field, right. so I have nothing to add. Right. Um, we'll probably go with one more question. Um, and again, if there's any questions from the audience, feel free to write it. Um, also, our other panelists, if you want to add any questions, otherwise I can just ask one last and um, finish this webinar. Um, so this is also from our new, um, newly reaching grads, ECRs, uh, who are kind of just building their their profile at the moment. And um, I think the question is, what would be the first steps to publicize their research that it reaches the community? So in terms of whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn, like there are some whose PIs may not be very tech savvy or may not be attending conferences and you're kind of doing things alone or with a little bit of a group. So how would you kind of go through that and still be able to promote in big conferences or, or through social media? I mean, the thing is there is trying to get as many presentations as you can, you know, whether it be poster presentations, oral presentations, going to as many conferences as you can, and, and also introducing yourself to some of the big players um, in the game uh, so that they know who you are. Um, I think that would probably be my biggest suggestion there. I like one suggestion, I think, or, or maybe Stacy also mentioned, do videos about, you know, a five minute or two, three minutes video about your your work, your paper or any or your software or anything, and then try to post it online. I think lots of well-known people in the field won't, you know, will, will happily um, retweet or boost or whatever well, if, if you do that. Um, and the, the more, um, skillful you are in producing these old videos, uh, the better. But yeah, there are people really, there are really people well, very good it. on this, <laughs> not doing this. So I think there are like awards, uh, uh, increasing number of awards that maybe you can also apply. Kind of, you know, that maybe you they need your uh, a YouTube video or something like that. Check, for instance, I don't know the National Societies in, in Proteomics. If we are here. They are, they're all have like awards available and sometimes to be able to apply for those, you have to do like a small video. That video needs to be judged by others. And if, if successful, it is kind of posted more. Um, I don't know, these kind of ideas. I think that uh, that's a very, of course, Twitter, it can also be useful. Again, there is, it's not only one thing, but I, I like also what the Logan said before, that do something that you like of all these ways of promotion and everything like that. Just choose the one that fits you the fits you the best because there are many you would not be able to do all of them. So just do the the one that uh, you know that or the ones that you prefer the most. I will say though, like I personally did not love networking at, at conferences and stuff. That for me was very awkward at first, and so it I kind of had to get out of my comfort zone a bit to get used to that feeling and realize that it's not that weird to introduce yourself to people and so on and so forth. So I would agree that yes, do things that you like, but also be willing to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. All right, thank you for hitting the hour. Um, if there's no other questions, um, then let's thank all the three speakers once again for your time, for your insights and all the recommendations uh, on how to promote uh, the work and hopefully the uh, our audience 
have gained um you know ways to now get onto the social media or or go to conferences and be able to uh introduce themselves um thank you everyone for joining us here today and a big thanks to charlotte and andreas who have been instrumental in organizing these webinars um also this uh webinar has been recorded so this will be uploaded and if anyone wants to go back uh, to see the slides or or any of the questions then feel free to do so and also thanks to jessica for co-chairing the session with me and um stay tuned for all the upcoming webinars uh we keep posting it we, we are very much on twitter and promote this so feel free to join thank you very much thank you very much <laughs> thank you thank you everyone thank you thanks everyone bye bye bye, -bye.